So last week on Easter, we referenced the story of Lazarus, the powerful, dramatic rescue story of Lazarus. And today I want to return to that story, specifically to the very end of the story. Uh, and so to work our way back into the story, let me just give you a real quick recap. So Mary and Martha, Lazarus sisters, sent word to Jesus, Jesus, the one that you love is sick. And Jesus said to his disciples, uh, this will not end in death. But then he made the curious decision to stay where he was for a, a couple more days. And during those uh, couple days, Lazarus died. And so we've got a problem. This will not end in death. And Lazarus died. And he said, Jesus said to his disciples, uh, God is going to glorify himself through this. This is why I didn't go. God is going to reveal himself. He's going to glorify himself. And so they, they go to Bethany. Martha comes out. Then Mary comes out to, to meet Jesus. And they both say the same exact thing. If you would have been here, our brother would not have died. Lazarus would not have died. And they were absolutely correct. If Jesus would have been there, he could have spoken a word like he had done so many times and conquered sickness. He could have healed Lazarus on the spot. But now Lazarus was dead. You see, Jesus was going after a bigger enemy. He wasn't just trying to show that he had power over sickness. He's going after death itself. And he said to them, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever believes in me will never, never die. And so then they didn't fully understand what he meant, and they began to weep. Jesus wept with them. And then they went to the tomb. And that's where we're going to pick the story back up today. If you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 11, verse 38. If you're using a pew Bible, that's on page 1669. John chapter 11, verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. One of the senses that God has given us is the sense of smell. And when it comes to this sense, God has not given the gift equally to all. Some people have better sniffers than, than others. Uh, unfortunately for my wife, God has given her a very keen sense of smell. And me, me not so much. Uh, smell is one of those senses that we don't usually think about. I think because we rely so much on, on sight, we rely so much on what we hear, we're not often thinking about what it is that we smell. Like probably the, the last minute, you haven't been thinking, what, what do I smell? It's something that we're not even uh, aware of until, until we smell something either pleasant, we walk past the lilies, or we smell something foul. And then, as soon as we smell something that we identify either as good or bad, then we become very aware of our sense of smell. So the other day, I was working up in my office, and Carla, down at the secretary's desk, was uh, she had a velvet vanilla candle that she had under a heat lamp. And the, those aromas 
wafted up the stairwell, and I could smell it, and, and I was drawn to it. It smelled so good. It, it made me want to come down and pester Carla just a little bit so that I could smell the velvet vanilla candle. I remember a, a bunch of years back, Karen and I had a bag of potatoes that we put in a cabinet drawer, in a cabinet, closed the drawer, and we forgot about them. And I guess we never used that cabinet drawer because uh, eventually I opened that cabinet and it was the foulest smell I've ever smelled. Like the worst smell. I've smelled a lot of bad smells. This was the foulest smell. Life has a smell. Death has a smell. And it's for this reason that Martha recoiled at this idea of taking that stone away. Like Jesus, he has been dead for four days, and even in four days, the, the process of decay has already started, and, and his body, it, it's, gonna, it's going to reek. That whole cavity, that whole space is filled with the scent of death. Let's not remove the stone. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you're going to see the glory of God? He could have easily just have said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you're going to smell the glory of God? And so they roll the stone away. Jesus commands Lazarus to come forth, and everybody there turns and looks at the, the mouth of the tomb and reflexively they cover their faces. They cover their nose. They know what is about to greet them. They know the, the, the stench of death that is coming their way. But then instead, they see Lazarus walk out. They see Lazarus walk out. He is alive, but he's still dressed with death's clothes. He's still wearing death's clothes. He's wrapped from head to toe in these grave linens. And so then Jesus gives the command, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And that's where the, the episode ends. But today I want to just pretend with you that the episode continues. As absur absurd as this is, imagine with me the story ending differently. Imagine with me Lazarus coming out Jesus say, seeing him and saying, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And the people there begin to unwrap the, the grave clothes, the linens, and Lazarus objects. Stop. Stop, Jesus. I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for raising me back to life. Like, that's really cool. <laughs> Didn't like being dead. But these grave clothes... I, I've actually grown kind of accustomed to them. You know, I, I kind of like the, the way they fit, kind of like the way they feel. In fact, I can't imagine doing life without these grave clothes. So if it's all right with you, I would like to just keep wearing them. Now, this is absurd, I understand. But would Jesus say, eh, no problem, Lazarus. You go on wearing death's clothes. They actually look pretty good on you. And that scent coming from death's clothes, no problem. Of course not. What would Jesus say? He would explain to Lazarus, Lazarus, you once were dead, but now you are alive. Take those clothes of death off. Get rid of them bury them, burn them, make no provision for them, have nothing to do with them. Don't put them in your closet to be taken out at a, a future point when you might want to wear them again. Don't put them in a tote for a season only to take them out for another season. Don't wad them up at the foot of your bed so that when you're in a rush or you're in a pinch, you can quickly throw them on. Put on new clothes. Why would you want to continue wearing clothes which reek of the stench of death when you've been made alive? 
And so we're forced to consider our own closets, our own wardrobe. I need to ask the hard question, how many articles of clothing am I still wearing or am I keeping in my closet or in a tote somewhere that I have no business keeping? Last week, wonderful Easter service, a highlight of the Easter service for sure was 12 young people who came forward and publicly in front of all of us professed faith in Jesus Christ. And then they got into the, the pool of, of baptism and they were baptized and it was, it was wonderful, but it wasn't as suspenseful as what happened that day with Lazarus. Like, I don't think there was anyone here who was holding their breath wondering if, if Leona, after she was placed under the water, if, she, if Taylor and Colleen were actually going to lift her back out. Like, nobody was, was anxiously holding their breath like, like that day with Lazarus. Like, is he really going to come out of the tomb? And so maybe it didn't have the same suspense as what happened with Lazarus. But I can assure you what happened this past Sunday was no less dramatic than what happened with Lazarus. Jesus uses the words, born again. Born again. A new life. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And listen to what he says. They have crossed over from death to life. We celebrated 12 new lives this past Sunday. Like Lazarus, every single one of us, those 12 individuals, every single person here who has called on the name of Jesus Christ, placed your hope and trust in him as your Lord and Savior, every single one of us has crossed over from death to life. And so what that means is that Jesus has spoken over you. He's spoken over you. He said, Jeremy, come forth. Diane, come forth. Virginia, come forth. Everyone who has placed their hope and trust in Jesus Christ, God has called us forth out of the tomb of death into life. And so how bizarre would it be for us who have been born again, for people who were dead in our sins and we have now been made alive with Christ, to want to continue wearing death's clothes, to want to continue wearing these, these grave clothes. You know what didn't happen Sunday, last Sunday? We didn't hand the microphone to those individuals after they came out of the, the baptismal pool so that they could begin to negotiate with God. Like, thank you, God. Thank you for this life that you've gifted me with. And now here are the articles of clothing that I want to continue to wear. That wasn't part of the equation. In Christ, we are called to take off the grave clothes. Why? Because we're no longer dead. We have been made alive. We haven't just been forgiven. We've been forgiven, but it's not just that. We have been made new. Josh stood and proclaimed the truth of 2 Corinthians 5.17 over every single one of those, those individuals. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You are a new creation. We who have been made alive with Christ, we have no business walking around in clothes that still carry the scent of death. Those clothes are just not in keeping with who we are. If we want to continue wearing those, those grave clothes, really what we're doing is we are masking the scent of life that is now in us with the scent of death. We are called to be the aroma of Christ. We are called to be the scent of life, 
the scent of Jesus everywhere we go. And if we say, no, I, I really want to hold on to these few articles of clothing, these grave clothes, then everywhere we go, instead of smelling life, what people smell is death. The smell of life draws people. The smell of death repels people. And so again, we need to ask, what are the grave clothes that I've kept in my closet? What are the grave clothes that you've been unwilling to, to part with, maybe afraid to part with? And the truth is, we all have them. We all have these, these attachments that are hard for us to give up. And, and, and we even recognize often that it's a fatal attraction. Like, I know this thing that I don't want to give up. It's not doing me any favors. It is not giving me life. It is giving me death, and yet I'm struggling to give it up. I don't want to consider a life apart from this article of clothing. Somehow, Satan has deceived us into believing that if we part with this article of death, we're going to die. <laughs> like, life is going to be diminished in some way if we don't have this thing that we're called to give up. Jesus once said, why do you look at the speck of dust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? First take out the plank in your own eye, then you'll be able to help the, your brother with that, that speck of sawdust. It, this sounds maybe juvenile and, and a little bit gross, but I think you'll recognize the, the truth of this statement we are more offended by somebody else's bad odor than we are our own, right? Like, I am, my stinky feet, I don't, don't like it, but I, I can tolerate, tolerate it, and truth be told, sometimes I don't even, I'm not even aware. Karen reminds me. Like, I'm not even aware. Yeah, my, my feet stink. But you put me in a room with someone else's feet who stink, and I am so offended. Wash your feet. Like, I don't want to be in that room with them. And so it is with the grave clothes. Like, we are curiously oblivious to our own grave clothes. Maybe not even offended by our own grave clothes, the own scent of death that we carry with us. But then we see someone else with an article of clothing that, that has the scent of death and, and think it's a huge deal. How offensive. Well, that's what Jesus was talking about. Take out the, the plank from your own eye, or to change the metaphor, take off the, the grave clothes that you're wearing, deal with your foul scent, the scent of death that you carry, and then maybe you'll be able to help somebody else in a, in a positive way. So the grave clothes that, that I struggle with may not be the grave clothes that you su struggle with, but what unites them is the, that scent of death. And because of our shared humanity, chances are that, that we all are struggling with a lot of the same things, right? A and I know this because the Apostle Paul wrote letters to the church encouraging them to take off their grave clothes of death. And then he would list all the things, the, all the articles of clothing that that entailed. And I recognize them. Like, oh, they wrestled with that too. And, and so because we need to put a finer point on this, let me just share uh, parts of that passage. This comes from Colossians chapter 3. Starting at verse 1, it says, Since you have been raised with Christ, since you have crossed over from death to life, since God has called you out of the tomb, Lazarus, come forth. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And now here it comes, skipping ahead to verse 5. It says, Put to death, or take off the clothes, Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You used to walk in these ways. You used to wear those clothes, but you're alive now. Rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other, 
since you've taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. And then skipping ahead to verse 12, now he tells us what to put on. See, we're not just taking things off. We're, we're putting things on. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together. So I'm not a, a fashionista at all, but people who are really mindful of outfits will tell you that there's that one thing that kind of ties the whole outfit together. Jesus identifies that one article of clothing as love. Put on love, and it binds the whole outfit together. This may not be true everywhere in the world, but it's certainly true, I think, in, in many places in our own uh, country there is something freeing about thinning out our closets. For those of us who have lots and lots of clothes, there's something freeing about thinning out our closets. There's something liberating that comes from discarding clothes that really we don't have any business wearing anyway. Take off the grave clothes, Jesus says. Take them off. Leave them off. Don't put them in your closet. Don't put them in a tote. Just be done with them. And then clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. Those are clothes that smell good. Those are clothes that smell like life. Those are clothes that smell like Jesus. Those are clothes that are going to draw people to Jesus inside of you. This morning we have the privilege of coming together to the table to meet with God, to be nourished, to be fed. And we come today, you come today not because you're worthy. You come today not because you've done such a good job of emptying out your closets and discarding all of those grave clothes. You actually come and I actually come because I'm needy, because we are needy. We, we have a God who is exceedingly gracious, exceedingly compassionate, a God who is slow to anger, who is abounding in love. He invites us to his table so that we might actually receive from him to be nourished by him. You see that that smell of life, we don't have the power to manufacture it. It's not something that you can go today and, and grit your teeth and, and create the smell of life. The smell of life is something that is imparted to us. It's given to us. It's a gift. It's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus inside of us. And, and he imparts his gifts to us here at the table. And so I want to invite you to come today. Come to receive. And if you have a, a great article of clothing that you know needs to be taken off and discarded, do business with God today. Tell him that. Acknowledge it, confess it, and resolve to, to part company with it, burn it. But come.